Hi there, this is Dennis Velko with Out Bureau. That is O U T B U R O dot com. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Out Bureau Voices, where we have fascinating and interesting impromptu dialogue with interesting LGBT professionals, entrepreneurs, and community leaders. Today, we have the privilege of being joined by Christopher Berno who is a lifelong entrepreneur. So we're going to have some interesting stories to get to. Thank you so much for joining us today, Christopher. Hi, Dennis. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as I love to do is get right in and start talking a little bit about your history. Uh, so if you could just give us a little bit of background to help uh, familiarize and set the frame for our conversation today. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Thanks again for uh, having me today. I think the work you're doing is so important for so many different reasons. And so I just want to, at the very onset, just say, first of all, thank you. And it's a real honor to, uh, to be a part of it. Thank you. Well, I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so uh, in terms of just kind of background and history, um, my career uh, started right out of college. Um, I went to school in uh, Southern Ontario. I'm Canadian <laughs> originally. Um, and uh, right after graduation, I got an undergraduate degree in uh, psychology and immediately um, upon graduation got into the technical workspace, I guess. I was uh, brought on to work with uh, barnesandnoble.com. And just to kind of give some context and some time frames here, we're talking about the late 90s. So um, what did that look like in terms of technology? Well, cell phones were, I think, you know, I think my dad had a cell phone in his car at that point that was hardwired, right? Mm -hmm. So people were not walking around with their uh, cell phones in hands like they are today. There was certainly no Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Not only was there, there was no MySpace. Um, really, the internet at that point, AOL was, 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 um, happening i guess then uh, i do i do remember? recall that that okay. era yeah and i think it's really important to put that context right because if you're i mean i'm in my uh, late 40s now so that that context really matters because younger people watching this aren't maybe you know aren't going to really understand what it meant to get into technology in the 90s like it meant getting into technology today um so that's why i bring that up but barnesandnoble.com was my first kind of foray into um into the technology world and what a cool time and space to be i mean but you know barnes and Noble is a, obviously a, a national brand. Obviously, it's a household brand name, right? You know, when I say Barnes and Noble, you know what they what they do. Um, but back in the '90s, that was it was a time for a massive transition from uh, you know selling books on shelves in iconic stores on main streets um, to transitioning that to the web and everything from the distribution. Um, from the sale online to, you know, distribution and getting that book from point A to point B. Um, so that was really my first kind of um, um, uh, foyer into, into tech. And um, I got, I kind of worked my way up through the ranks there. And by the time I left Barnes and Noble, um, I was uh, the manager of uh, distribution and um, e-commerce. So basically managing all of the touch points from the time the customer ordered the book online to the time that the customer received their book. And, you know, a lot of touch points back then. Um, one thing I did want to say about that time frame, which was kind of interesting, is that, you know, Amazon was not a household name then. Correct. And uh, just kind of looking back, it's kind of cool to, I remember, and I was part of this too, and I mean, certainly, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and I think Steve Jobs said, you can only connect the dots looking back. But at the time, I remember actually Amazon being mocked by my superiors um, and, you know, the, the senior, senior leadership team um, at Barnes & Noble. And I remember one particular all-hands meeting where they are saying like, uh, oh, does anybody want a toaster, you know, with that bestseller? And what they were implying was that it's just silly to have this place where you can go and get everything you need on one, on one website. We're going to focus on books and solely books. And now history, you know, has a way of showing <laughs> who the winner is going to be in those scenarios. Right. And, mm -hmm. uh, looking back, you know, it's, it's really, it was, it's really, you don't realize it at the time, but you're learning so much, you know, as you're, even if you do have a job with a company, you're not ready to be an entrepreneur yet that, that you can soak up so much learning, um, during that process of, uh, working for other companies, um, and, you know, finding opportunity in other companies. But so I belabored that, but barnesandnoble.com was an incredible learning experience for me. Um, I got recruited out of there with a dot com out of San Francisco. And it's funny because dot com used to mean something uh, like, you know, it's like kind of the, it's what we used to call startups so you, working for a dot com. Right. Right. Or the, uh, the, 
dot com bubble burst of two thousand and one, but um, it was a, a wireless uh, company called OmniSky. And what a cool! I mean, just going from you know a, a household major brand like Barnes and Noble to a, a startup that basically no one's heard of before, OmniSky.com. And basically, what they did as cell phones were starting to uh, take on more popularity and, and more and more people were adopting cell phone technology and mobile in their hands. It was still, it was only voice at that point in time. So if you take a time machine back now to say to 1999 or 2000 cell phones were in people's hands, but all it was, was voice. Right. Mm -hmm. So again, context that might be hard for someone like a millennial or, you know, Gen Gen Z um, to wrap their mind around, but a mobile device, all it was, was voice. There was no chat. You certainly weren't sending files and you certainly weren't watching video. You were talking and that's about it. And what OmniSky did back in 2000 was create a cradle, if you will, for your, for your phone, uh, which allowed you to connect to the internet and move data with cellular packets. So it was the very first time that you could actually transmit text data, like like we do now with text messages. Okay. Um, and, and at that time, it was just so monumental. And it was an absolute no brainer for me to take that job. And I was managing their technical support operations. Um, uh, and so like I said, it was a San Francisco based startup called OmniSky. And that was just such a great experience too, in a different way. Um, I, I'll say one thing that's you know, a pivotal moment in my career was September 11th. And, um, you know, it's just, I, I, I remember that day. I remember where I was and we had so many of our customers were actually in, uh, you know, the, the world trade centers and, and literally within, um, uh, within two weeks of, of September 11th, 2001, we were, you know, we were, we were closed. So wow. yeah, really fascinating. And it's, um, a tragic and, but, but fascinating and it's great lessons well, that learned. You know. What's interesting is that, you know, yes, that was devastating to a building and a, several buildings around. I actually lived in New York at the time and was just blocks, you know, I actually had people from that area because uh, I, I, one of my clients was Deutsche Bank uh, mm -hmm. and it was right across the street. I don't know if you recall back when that was happening uh, uh, on TV, there would be this big, dark, almost black, it was very dark brown building that had the American flag on it. I do. And they kept showing, well, that was the Deutsche Bank building. And so that I was there and I was there, I was working on that client during all of this. And so um, I had actually, uh, and then I had friends uh, who lived right across the street. Uh, closer to the uh, harbor area, and so when my ex and I, we had a um, a condo uh, apartment uh, on tenth and uh, between tenth and ninth on twenty. Oh wow! So you were right there, Ch Chelsea. Well, we were like considered Chelsea, mm -hmm. um, just as the uh, galleries were going into that area, moving up to that area, and uh, so I actually had people walk because you couldn't get a taxi, you could obviously couldn't do subway. And so they would, they actually walked to our apartment. Um, so within about two hours of all of that happening, we had three people, three additional people, uh, uh, one couple who lived there and one guy that was work, was on his way to work <laughs> uh, in the building, uh, get diverted and going, oh my God, I can't go back all the way to Brooklyn where I live. So can I come to your place? <laughs> and uh, we're like, yeah, crazy. So, but, but what's interesting is, is that having that happen to, um, to that, to that building and the surrounding area affected a dot com. So, so, so much that they had to close their doors. You know, you would think that those businesses like, you know, it didn't shut down Deutsche Bank. It didn't shut down, you know, those other businesses. So I'm, you know, we don't have to necessarily get into that. I just thought that that was very interesting that that event would have caused that dot com to uh, go under. Indeed, and I think it's just things change, right? I mean, yeah. things change. Things change in in global economies. Things change in markets. Things change in your home. Things change in life. And I think you know, um, I couldn't have been on a higher high in my career at that point in time, right? And to go from um, just in terms of income, autonomy, uh, excitement for the product for the future to unemployed, <laughs> you know, in, uh, in San Francisco and, uh, really not sure what's next. Cause nobody was hiring that. I mean, I mean, it was, it, there, there were a lot of parallels to what's happening, happening today with COVID. I mean, I wouldn't 
you, I don't think you can compare them, but in terms of just the m amount of change that's happening, I mean, I'd say that this is a hundred times September 11th in terms of the change that's coming down the pipeline as a result of it. But the world changed that day and you know it <laughs> as well as I do. And I'm sure right. people who are old enough to remember that here can relate to that. But it's important, the lesson and the takeaway from that is that things do change, right? And that can be great for in terms of creating new opportunity for new startups. You know, one thing leads to another. And the rest of the story really is, is that's kind of, you know, going through that September 11th experience and being unemployed and, and, and really kind of propelled me into the work that I'm doing today and got me into, you know, the hosting industry, um, which was really, you know, in its early, early days back then. Um, if you, you know, even trying to explain something like a domain name to somebody back in 2000, you know, I would get it a lot like, uh, well, what do I need a domain name for? What do I need a web page for? There's the yellow pages. Uh, you know, I can get, I can take out a newspaper ad. Like I don't need your, uh, <laughs> you know, your, um, your witchcraft website stuff. Yes. Uh, can you yeah. remember those times? I mean, it was real. I mean, that was yeah. real. It seems silly today, but it was real back then. Um, oh, yeah. I, I can remember. I've owned a couple of, you know, dot coms and have tried, you know, the entrepreneurial thing of, of trying to launch things and having to try to explain to family members and friends. It's like, well, you have your website. Why do you need a <laughs> domain name? Well, right. that's the URL, the address that you put in. And then what is this hosting? Well, you, if you right. already have a, 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 the domain name you talked about, why, are you ta why do you need to spend more money on hosting? Uh, because that's where the files reside on, you know, it's just like OMG, trying to explain it. Getting back to your, your, your point on <clears throat> for, for the younger folks out there, um, talking about the history, you kind of brought back a memory of mine that I'd like to share for a moment. And, I came up in the military working in, in computers uh, and helped open the very first technology call-in center help desk for 5th Corps military based in Frankfurt and so forth. And so I was working first on 286s. And we were so excited when 386s come out. Okay, folks out there, look it up. Because <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't, I'm going to have to look it up, I think. A 386. Look it up. Yeah, oh, okay. well, and before that was a 286. It was a processor speed. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. And so, um, you know, we're talking back when, when uh, you know, there wasn't even Microsoft, right. you know, and so that was really funny. So I was used to using DOS based commands uh, to get things done and your, your word processor was totally text based. There was no, there was no mouse, there was no visual interface. It was all text on the screen. And, um, I, I, uh, when I, uh, my ex and I came back from Germany, uh, I started working for this company. I helped build their, their database uh, in their marketing group. And uh, it, I remember this one day, uh, he and I went to some friend's house and uh, Jeff and Jeff, <laughs> and, and Jeff, they, they, I'll say Jeff the hottie, um, he was also into computers. And he's like, Hey, Dennis, you know, because he knew I was into technology as well. He goes, hey, Dennis, come up here. I want to show you something on my computer. And um, I'm like, sure. He goes, look at this. It's called Windows. I was like, oh, my God, that's, ma <laughs> that's magical. I mean, it was, yeah, it was like Windows 3.1 or something. And uh, so from that point on, it was like, uh, yeah, I mean, I remember the very day that I first got introduced to Windows, and that was like back in 1991 or 92. So, yeah, yeah. we've come we've come a long way, <laughs> haven't we? Yeah, and I think that's really important. Those are really important lessons. I, I think everyone's you know future focused, which is great. But at the end of the day, the technology's changed, but humans haven't. I mean, I'm not a I'm not a biologist or an anatomist, but our brains have not changed the way the computer chip has changed, right? Our processing right. power has not kept up with Moore's law, like what you just talked about. There's no brain 286, 386, 486. I mean, our, our ability to intake information, process information, input information as humans really hasn't changed that much, but the technology around us has. So that context that you're talking about, that's why history does matter, in my opinion, Dennis. And that's why, like, if I could that's why I'm so passionate and so grateful to be able to be here because that's the advice I want to share is that it does matter. You need to look back 
in order to be able to look forward well. And um, you do need to look back, like when the TV was introduced. If, you're, if you are looking to be an entrepreneur and you are looking to bring valuable products to market, because at the end of the day, humans have not changed in the past 500 years. Technology sure as hell has, but we have not. Our brains right. still process the same way. So going back and understanding how societies took to the radio, how societies took to TV, how societies took to Sony Walkmans, how societies took to cell phones, to web, to mobile, it, it really matters. And it can really help you provide context and help you, you know, formulate your plan and your products um, if you are looking to get into starting up a company. So looking back matters. And I think us old guys uh, have a lot to offer in that regard. Because I think when I talk to people who don't pay attention and don't go look back, they're missing an opportunity, I think, I believe. Yeah, I, I totally can see that point. You know, having a little bit of understanding of the sociology and psychology. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's uh, the more you understand and or yourself or the more you, you read, you listen to podcasts about it, mm -hmm. or you have someone on your team or within your realm of being a mentor or a friend who has that kind of perspective, uh, is important because you're right. There has to be that point of of understanding how it fits within the the scope and the the realm of products and services, and and also the the uh, 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 the adaptability, but the adoption of products and services. You know, how does this mesh with where we are today, and you know, unless you're a real, uh, unless you have the, the money, you know, for, you know, for example, Apple, when they first came out with their, I, uh, their, their iPod, uh, you know, music in this tiny, tiny box was like the size of my, you know, hand, right? Tiny, but it, you could store digital music, but no one knew you wanted to do that. Now, the good thing is, is right. that App Apple had the bank account and the wallet uh, to, to create the demand. You know, right. if, you're, if you're a bootstrap startup, if you're creating something that's never been out there before, you, you have to see where the gaps are and fill a gap and then do really great, you know, bootstrap marketing and so forth to get there. But if you follow just on the cusp of the trends, and then create what's called a minimum value product right. um, uh, to, to test that introduction of that product and then improve it over time as, as it gets adopted and you start getting those early, early customers. Um, so let's kind of transition into, you know, city screen. Tell us a little bit about that and, um, you know, kind of the, 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 the why. Sure. What what started that for you? I'm always interested in understanding the why because it's the driver that keeps you focused and working on something, even though uh, the the you might have naysayers. <laughs> sure. Sure. I think um um you know it, just in terms of the why, um I know well I learn you learn a lot right as you go and and part of that learning process too is learning what I what I like to do um what what I'm good at what other people thought I was good at but also what kind of got me up in the morning and got me, you know, really jazzed about what I was going to work on that day, that week, that quarter. And um, over time in the, in the hosting industry, I, you know, just was fortunate enough to have some great mentors uh, kind of help me develop my leadership skills. And as a result of that, you know, took on more responsibility, uh, growing teams globally, working on different continents and working as an expat, just tons and tons of learning kind of led up to helping me understand what really what mattered to me the most in terms of my career and what I wanted to do. And I, I really, I found, you know, as I was taking assignments or working for uh, in, in the hosting space was that I got just naturally kind of thrown into the worst kind of problem situations that they had. Right. And that's where people just kind of put me. Um, and, but it really, I gravitated to that. I kind of gravitated to where the action was. Um, I was not a maintainer. I, I learned that about myself. I was not about, um, you know, like a lot of managers these days are just about doing more, faster, better, more, faster, better, more, faster, better. Um, and that's great, but there, that there's, you know, diminishing returns on that at some point before you start burning people out and you start burning systems out and you start just burning out. Um, I know 
and the reason I'm an entrepreneur now, and the reason I'm an, I'm a, I'm a serial CEO, a startup CEO now is because I like that, that ramp. Um, mm. and that's kind of, you know, I've, I've, I I've totally been, agree. You get it? Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm not to, to the me, guy. It, to me, oh, it's sorry. a build, to me, that, that build phase, taking nothing, taking absolutely nothing but an idea right. and creating a brand there, creating a brand, creating brand recognition and seeing that take root, you know, take hold and take root and start to grow and, and knowing that all of your efforts are, are, you're seeing your efforts come to fruition is so rewarding. It's like, yeah. that is it. And yeah, so sorry, I didn't mean, I no. didn't mean to cut you off there. It's just like, that to me is like the most exciting thing. When things get to be so routine, uh, that's why I'm a horrible employee. Horrible. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> <laughs> because <clears throat> if it's routine, I'm a, fab, I'm a fantastic consultant. Mm. Like you, mm. parachuting in to problem mm. situations in my past career, I was very mm. well known for that. Uh, so you, they can take the worst account with the worst personalities, the worst situation you could, with, where projects were way over budget, under delivering, and hostile clients. I would parachute in and within three months have it turned around and have them sign a new contract yeah. because they love the work. But put me in the put me in the same situation where even working in a large corporation where I have to go to work every day and and it's doing the same thing processing the same kind of stuff answering the same kind of questions routine 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 oh my gosh you might as well slip my wrist and put me in the ground but you because know what though Dennis you know what's important is that those people like I wouldn't have the same level of success that I have today without those maintainers right without the that is so critical in a business, right? Oh, it is. is. Those it's, people who have that, because you take some people and you put them into this startup scene and they just go bananas, right? Like it's right. just chaotic. It's too crazy. So I, if there is people, if there are people watching that are those maintainers and, and really good, strong leaders that kind of take the torch and take it into the next five years, those are the people that make us the money really right? because they, 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 you know, they rally the troops and, and, and keep people focused on the prize and, and the end game and, and moving towards that, constantly improving. That's invaluable to any yes. business. So yes. those people are wicked valuable. It's, it's just not me <laughs> or you, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> yeah, well, well, and I don't mind, like, like I could see out Euro in, in, you know, I have a growth plan uh, as revenue comes on, but it's, it's the, um, <laughs> to put it like my ex of 17 years, um, he was, he's, a, he's a software developer and it, you know his idea of security is is being employed by someone going into and sitting in a cubicle where he has you know Susie on one side and Joe on the other and he sees them every day and right. you know he's working on a project that management has given him and and that's okay i'm not that's not i'm not trying to be negative i'm just saying that that which is actually one of the huge contentions in our personal relationship because we're, he is that kind of a person that had to have routine, 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 routine. And I'm the kind of person who thrives on change and a risk taker. And uh, so yeah, that's it takes why a, I'm, I, I'm, I, not, I'm a not a good use. employee. <laughs> it, it does take a village. I know that's a, I know it's a political, mm -hmm. I don't mean to politicize anything here, but it, it does take a village really to grow an empire. It does. It does. And, and yeah, so, true. and a lot of, one of the problems I find with a lot of startup communities is that they alienate, uh, you know, it's all about that startup, that idea. Ideas are worthless, Dennis. They're worthless until they're acted upon. And to get them to a, a point where you've got traction in a marketplace, it takes a that's village. It takes a unique team. And part of being, you know, a great entrepreneur is assembling that team. So I believe startup communities should be, there should be just as many operations managers, career operations managers, directors, you know, customer service people. I want those people on my startup teams. I look for them because Absolutely. you can have a thousand idea people around you. And you're not getting shit done. And you, I'm sorry, <laughs> you can beep that out. That brings us, I guess, to, you know, the project that I'm working on now. So as a kind of a, a serial startup CEO. And that's kind of how I, I position myself in the market. Um, I selected this particular project 
uh, to work on um, for a bunch of different reasons. But what, what basically we're working on now is kind of mashing up. If you look at, um, uh, you know, mobile phones today, you look at tablets, um, even desktop computers, laptops, there's, those screens have so much interactivity to them. You're, you're either, it's either got touchscreen capabilities or, um, you know, we're texting, sending files. But our, our, our biggest screens, our TV screens that are in our living rooms um, and waiting rooms and all over the, everywhere we look really, um, they're pretty much still a one-way street in terms of transmission. Information's flowing from a central server, you know, out and the flow is going one way. And what City Screen does is create a kind of an abstract layer on top of the TV that makes your TV work a whole lot more like your phone or your tablet um, and really kind of changes your living room experience. So uh, by incorporating gaming functionality, um, um, transmitting information, uh, really kind of socializing the entertainment space more. Hmm. So um, we call it like a second screen experience. So as you're watching your favorite reality TV show, you can now watch it with your friends and family. Um, and oh, also right. creates a tremendous amount of advertising, really contextual advertising opportunities for brands and advertisers that want to connect and really provide the audiences with really cool new experiences that were never possible before on TV. So it's a really exciting space. It's new. Kind of to your point a little bit earlier, Dennis, it's um, um, it's much easier when you have a budget to create the demand. I think that's the term that you used a few minutes ago, and that was very poignant, <laughs> well put. But I think that's where you know we struggle the most right now is creating the demand, and the way you do that is by showing people what it's capable of. So it's um it's a really exciting space to be in right now, and um um you know hopeful that uh, uh that the next uh, three or four years are going to create a tremendous amount of opportunity. Um. If I may, just one point I want to put, remember we talked about a few minutes ago around change and September 11th and other things, you know, uh, what we've gone through together collectively as residents of planet Earth, you know, COVID-19 and, and um, that sort of thing, that's just another example of massive change. And one of the interesting things for us is as we were creating, you know, interactive second screen applications for smart TVs, we're a smart TV app. But okay. COVID-19 has really changed that. And we realized, you know, as we were down and, you know, this year was supposed to be about getting the MVP to market and really starting to connect with our audiences and our advertisers. Um, I mean, that was all halted in, in March. Um, it kind of took us back to the drawing board. And really what we understood is that we've got a, a product here that allows us to interact with TV and in, in public areas and retail locations, in uh, doctor's offices. Um, in schools allow you to interact with much, much, much bigger screens at scale and interact with large audiences with big screens without any kind of touching, right? You don't have to touch the screen. Um, you oh, use your mobile no. phone and interact with the screen. You can game, you can take coupons with you. Um, you can download files from that big screen onto your phone. And so my point is that um, sometimes when it looks really awful and, and I know there's a lot of, believe me, it's hurt us. It's, we've had to go back to our board and our investors and explain, you know, what we're doing with this time. It's their money, <laughs> right? And, uh, but really kind of interesting because now we can come back to the marketplace when the time's right, which is sooner than later, I believe, and show that we're capable of a whole lot more than we even thought we were capable of as a result of, uh, you know, COVID-19 and having some time to reevaluate. Oh, very, very interesting. I, I don't know if it's on your radar, but <clears throat> it just popped in my head as uh, which is how these conversations go. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but the not only, you know, the the um, one is, you know, like being in a doctor's office and being able to, you know, have on the screen, you know, information, maybe the doctor, uh, there was a doctor in Columbus, Ohio that it, while sitting in the waiting room, uh, he always <laughs> had health information on uh, like YouTube channels of health information and then he would come on and talk about it. But, you know, like in today's time too, you know, you probably don't want to be sitting in the doctor's waiting room if you're even allowed anymore. Uh, you may have to be sitting in your car waiting, but, uh, you know, yeah. th those magazines, don't touch them. Because you don't know who's who's been there before and what what illness they had, and it was you know now now in retrospect it was kind of gross and creepy to begin with. It does seem like that. Isn't that funny? I was just thinking that the other day too. Is like something's yeah. like it just seems gross to touch that now. Like, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. A, another thing too, just again off the top of my head, is uh, I recall reading uh, a news article 
probably now close to eight or nine months ago, uh, where, you know, Mc, sorry, McDonald's, but, um, you know, those, those touch screens that they have in a lot of McDonald's where you can order your food, uh, they, they did samplings of those, and the vast majority of all of them had, you know, fecal matter uh, on it. Uh, so, you know, poop particles uh, from people going to the restroom and or not even there, but previously to that, and then, you know, using their fingers on those screens. And so that's a touch point now that could, that we now recognize could also transmit COVID, you know, in addition to that other particle. Um, and so that would be interesting to, you know, ha as you're looking at your technology uh, and what you're doing is, you know, possibly how to create an interactive menu for restaurants of all sizes uh, to take advantage of this and be able to, you know, to order while they're standing, you know, in line or, you know, beforehand. Yeah, I just for the more technical people, and even if you're not, if you want to research it, um, first of all, we're cityscreentv.com, not to plug shamelessly, sorry, Dennis, but no um, worries. That's more why your logo is right there. <laughs> uh, more importantly, uh, would be, um, if you're interested in the technology that drives it, we do work on open source. We've uh, uh, assembled the open source technology in a way that creates a valuable, brings tons of valuable value to the market. But if you want to research, we're running on socket.io. Um, that's kind of the open source uh, technology that we're using to power our smart TV, our, our, our um, smart TV to mobile applications. So it's socket.io technology and it allows you to create these touchless experiences. And you're right, Dennis. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I those seem so modern last year walking into a Burger King or a McDonald's and seeing those screens. And then, you know, it just directed the order to the back, but I wouldn't touch that thing with a, with your finger <laughs> today, you know, like, no. And so, yeah, I think the future is very, very bright. Um, and it, it, that was not on our radar uh, last year at this time. Life right. <laughs> yeah. This, this, this is opening up possibly uh, Indeed. new opportunities and, and creating obviously then not only the opportunity for you to think about the the new fields and new new ways in which it could be used uh but then creating the demand right indeed, indeed. so very 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 interesting it's going to so, be an interesting ride <laughs> <laughs> so if you could you know as an as a serial entrepreneur um what has been some of the kind of the biggest challenges, whether in this particular company, cityscreentv.com, mm -hmm. or, uh, or others that you've had, um, you know, so, you know, so maybe someone is, is out there and looking at this time and saying, you know, maybe they're out of a job or they realize the volatility of their employment. And maybe they're saying, you know, maybe that idea I have is is time to go for it uh what are some perhaps tips or things that you would you would say you know pay close attention to or be cautious of or you know what kind of advice would you have for a budding entrepreneur mm -hmm. um well first of all around ideas because that's where it all starts right um I, I, I said it earlier, I said ideas are useless. And I, I said that a little bit flippantly, but at the end of the day, um, it's, it's, it's very easy to get, there's all these startup forums that are, 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 are flourishing, right? And they're going to absolutely grow exponentially as a result of what we've been through with lockdown and stuff like that. People coming up with ideas, getting into these communities, trying to sell them. But the bottom line is that those ideas need to have plans formulated around them, teams formulated around them, and plans and put in place and then executed against in order for them to kind of get any value. There are people that will disagree with me on that, but my experience shows because I've, I've failed colossally trying to pitch ideas um, in the heyday of kind of pitching, right? And, and, and did the circuit globally, which costs me and my organizations dearly. So learn from my mistakes, if you will. Don't pitch ideas. You need to pitch products. So really understand the problem that your product is solving. I, I would encourage you if you, next time you're talking to an entrepreneur or a starter, just ask them that simple question. What problem is Out Bureau solving? What mm -hmm. problem is CityScreen solving? What problem is company X solving with that product? 
And you'd be surprised how many people get tripped up on that simple answer. So really understand that and then understand what the, what the value of that solution is to that population of, of people or what, <laughs> whether you're making plant food or whatever it is, what, what is the, what's the market for that? How many people are affected by that problem? Um, and if you, can, if you can connect those two dots, then you can start to get really smart people paying attention to you. But so many people miss that point. They're so hung up on the idea um, and, 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 and get so emotionally attached to the idea. Um, right. and, then, and then they can't figure out why someone's not willing to write a $3 million check or a $300,000 check for them. And, and it, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, people make it look very easy. <laughs> you know. And I think that's part of probably a marketing. It's not. Um, it, it's not. It, 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 I'm not trying to make it sound harder than it has to be, but you really have to do the work. Oh, um, absolutely. Absolutely. It is, uh, you know, you always hear about the success stories, uh, you know, on, in Inc. Magazine and Forbes.com. And it sounds like these companies just sprung up overnight and are an overnight success. And they're yeah. not. There's possibly years and years behind yep. them. And even, even because an entrepreneur's journey is typically not one hit unicorn wonders, right? You typically, like yourself, I've, I've had a couple of companies myself in the past and on different, focusing on different areas, and, but each was a learning opportunity. 100%. And, you know, what I took away from serving Fortune 1000 Fortune 1, level or Fortune 500 level companies in technology and business processing, I put into practice here. What I learned running an estate sale business, actually, <laughs> where I had to attract both the homeowner, estate owner, and uh, a following of, of people uh, in a city that would literally follow me every other week around the city, you know, is like, wow, that's like getting a following online. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> because these folks would come out, snow, rain, or sleep, because they knew I always took the best, best clients, best homes. And mm -hmm. they loved my... I, I tried to always have uh, mid-century modern, um, which is my thing. But at any rate, is a you you need to see exactly a um, a problem, and there's uh, there's a lot of ways to kind of uh, analyze that. And I encourage folks to check out several articles on outbureau.com. Again, that's o u t b u r o dot com. Uh, there, there's tips. For, um, you know, if you'd like to be an entrepreneur thinking about, you know, ideas, uh, there's uh, an article on doing what's called SWOT, that is your uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, evaluating the market space. Uh, it, it gives you great advice on, on doing that. Um, and I even give the example of you need to really look at all of your potential competitors and your competitors you know, are, are things you, you may not even realize. So, uh, so we talk about uh, that, for example, you're also competing with, uh, as a gym, for example. So let's say you want to start a gym. So part of your competitors uh, is YouTube and Facebook. Because if someone is sitting on their couch just twiddling away on, on Facebook, then they're not in your gym. Now, you know, you might like that because they're still paying their monthly fees, but, um, but you know, so it talks about looking at your, uh, your competitive space and, and really thinking about more than just your, your direct competitors, but your indirect competitors as well. And even people who might think of you as a competitor, even though you don't think of them. And what that helped uh, with all of that, there's also uh, articles on creating a business plan um uh looking at your marketing and so forth um and so, and so what 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 i have found and and i will admit i i'm a um as i've described it before i'm a uh ready shoot aim kind of a guy i had to think about that for a second ready, ready shoot aim got because, it um <laughs> well i i'm a you know one of the one of the things too is you need to do your homework you need to do your analysis but sometimes people will get so in in the weeds on analyzing that they then don't take action right. 
And so one of my uh, statements that I have, which I've said in my uh, interview with uh, Larry, is magic and miracles happen when you have faith, believe in yourself, awesome. and you take action. That's awesome. Because if you do not take action, nothing will happen. It's just like, you know, I'm learning YouTube. I, I learn something every single day. And so right now I'm taking the, creating my, my content stack through doing interviews like this. So there's mm -hmm. video, which becomes podcast. I'm mm -hmm. uh, out bureau is now on 13 different apps. Plus I tra uh, transcribe that into using AI into text. Well, I could watch all the videos on how to optimize your YouTube channel, the YouTube channel. I could sit there and I could spend four hours a day watching you other YouTube videos on how to create and optimize YouTube videos, right? But if I don't actually put it into practice and actually start doing it, nothing will happen. Right. And so, and I, I'm also being an entrepreneur right now of one, being a, a company of one, self-funded bootstrap and so forth. Um, you know, I myself can get into, oh my gosh, I have the LinkedIn group, I have the website, I'm trying to create content, I'm trying to do videos and so forth. But at the end of the day, every single day, I do something that moves out Bureau forward. Something, whatever that is. And I think that's a real lesson. It's like if, if you do have your idea, uh, you can be an idea guy and you can be an idea person, let's say, sorry. Uh, non-gender binaries and females out there um you, you can you can be the idea person and that's fantastic but unless you have unless you're committed to that idea and you begin researching the idea to your point to see is this viable is what problem does this solve why is this important to you why would this be important to someone else right because i could i could have the the I could have the next idea for a fantastic, you know, coffee mug, but unless, unless I start putting it into practice, unless I start actually working on it, all it is is a bunch of ideas. Exactly. So, and, and, and platforms like this, like what you're working on, uh, create opportunity for us to take action, right? So like you're creating a, a path for us to take some action. And, and get the word out there about the products and services that we're working on. So that's why that's the value that you're putting into the marketplace, right? Which is wicked valuable. And also I, I would just also say is that don't underestimate the, um, uh, the value of this asset or these assets that you're accumulating and sharing with other people, right? Think of it, you know, I somehow I doubt this will ever be the number one video on YouTube that, you know, that crashes the server. However, the long tail kind of effects of something like this, even if it helps like four people, right? It was worth the hour we spent together, in my opinion. And I would do it a hundred times over again. So. A absolutely. Uh, for me, it's, it's valuable to have visibility of entrepreneurs, professionals, and leaders who happen to be LGBTQ mm -hmm. so that other LGBTQ persons out there can see and hear from them and know that they can do it too. 100%. And uh, so on outbureau.com, there is a group. Uh, so if you create your profile, you can actually uh, join groups similar to joining groups on Facebook or LinkedIn. Uh, there is an out startup group uh, that's ran by a fantastic uh, lesbian entrepreneur. Awesome. Uh, everyone is also able to create a group uh, for themselves, their, uh, their industry, uh, their geographic focus, and so forth. Uh, groups on Out Bureau can be public, meaning that they are open and searchable, indexable by uh, the, the search engines. They can be private, where you have to be a group member in order to see the content, and they can also be secret. So, for example, you know, if you if you want to work with your clients and communicate with your clients, or create just a group uh, where you know you and your um, uh, uh, people involved in your business in City Screen would like to have a collaboration space, but wanting to not use other systems. That's a that's a capability. Uh, I would always like to also remind people that uh, you are able to indicate whether you are open to being a mentor of other 
individuals on the site, uh, on your professional profile, and indicate the idea, the areas in which you are open to being a mentor. And then you can also uh, indicate whether you uh, would like to be a mentee, you would like a mentor, and the areas. And then using the, um, the search filters under the members uh, search, you're able to locate each other. So you're also able to, uh, uh, when you're searching for other people, whether that's industry, location, and so forth, you're able to connect and friend each other, just like similar to Facebook and LinkedIn. And once you do that, you're able to direct message. So it's a platform in where you can create meaningful relationships, uh, seek out opportunities. And for example, you'll be able to connect with uh, Christopher on the site and learn more about uh, uh, the, the business and directly message uh, him to find out how you might be able to use City Screen Solutions in your business. So, uh, so being an entrepreneur is also lots of work, right? We spend lots of, lots of hours during the day and sleepless nights. So what are some of the ways, Christopher, that, that you kind of de-stress, reconnect, and so forth. What are perhaps maybe some of your hobbies or things that you like to do? Uh, I just, uh, I, I'm, um, for the past year, I've been kind of bi-coastal. I've been bouncing back and forth between Los Angeles and my um, domiciled home based in South Florida and Broward County. Um, but uh, I'm in upstate New York right now in a farm kind of environment. I took up gardening this year. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm like, so like as soon as I'm done work, which is never, I'm like taking time out to go like water my plants and stuff like that. Dennis, I love it. I can't tell you how much my partner's actually like, like looking out in the because <laughs> first of all, we're not used to having this much space and this much green <laughs> around us. And uh, my partner, you know, look out and be like, oh my God, he's out there watering the plants again. What's his problem? I love it. I, so yeah, I think having hobbies and uh, other things that kind of distract you, um, you know, as long as they're controlled, right? And when you come back, you come back kind of refreshed with an uh, open mind and able to, um, 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 you know, address the same problem from a different perspective. I think just honestly, my advice around this would be take such good care of yourself <laughs> no one else is going to do it for you you know the food you put in your body the rest you get mm, i know there's all this talk about staying up all night but that's not me i mean i i i am a seven hour sleep guy and i get it i get it yeah. and if you have to wait for my deliverable i'll let you know responsibly but i get that sleep i get that exercise i take really good care of my body and especially you know as getting older um you know that that matters more and more yeah, absolutely. Well, definitely so far, you know, the, the outdoor gardening is, is a big theme. Um, so, you know, that, that it's a connection of uh, nature. It's, it's something yeah. you can do. I enjoy it. I've always enjoyed it. Uh, uh, in my past, with my exes, I've, when we have purchased homes, uh, I always purposely purchased kind of the ugliest house in the best neighborhoods. <laughs> Uh, with the worst yards and as uh, my realtors would always be like what you know why are you doing this it's like here? yeah it's because well I probably won't like if some if I bought a house with already the garden done the likelihood of me liking it all is slim uh, and so why, why yeah why, why would I be paying top dollar for something I don't like or why would I be paying top dollar for a kitchen remodel that isn't my style right I'd rather buy a house uh, that that practically need, just has good bones and needs everything done that so that's one of my hobbies when I can uh, when I've done it in the past um, and uh, I personally like to hike and walk a lot so um, I average about three to four miles a day. Yeah, that's good stuff. That's yeah, good. it's great, great to connect. And, you know, I can't uh, stress uh, for, for folks how, how often I actually solve problems while mm -hmm. I'm on my box. So sometimes I listen to meditative music. Sometimes I'm listening to, you know, my beats, my dance music, my EDM. Um, sometimes I'm listening to podcasts. Um, about entrepreneurialism and so forth and uh, but even if I'm listening to music I'm often still thinking about my problem as I as I've had to tell people yeah. it might look like I'm not doing anything but I'm actually working even yeah. if I'm just sitting in the city I've had to tell you know neighbors do you see me just sitting in the backyard you can say hello but unless I initiate 
a, a conversation, I, I'm probably working, even though it might not look like it. <laughs> mm. Yep. I can so, relate to that. I think that that whole, uh, you know, work to your knuckles, bleed Silicon Valley startup type. I think it's going to die a, a hard death over time. And, and people are going to realize that you are, you know, you're a, you're can be a very well optimized machine yourself as a human, right? Um, if you treat the machine properly and maintain it, feed it properly, exercise it, give it rest and uh, let it reboot. Um, I think we're going to find that uh, um, that's a lot more tied to success than going at burning the candle from both ends for decades. Absolutely. What I like to do, in, uh, as uh, folks will see in the writings that I do, is I define it, I, I say, a uh, success as you define it. That's because right. so often people get hung up in, in you know, the, the trying to catch up with the Joneses, trying to have is, you know, thinking that success is having the, you know, $4 million house that you see uh, on the canal uh, with the big million dollar boat behind it and so forth but you Seems know tacky, actually. <laughs> yeah and so it, it's a um you know whatever whatever your happiness is and um you know you have to define that for yourself so um so one plug on being ha on, on being healthy uh if you have not seen the episode or heard the episode we unfortunately didn't do the video at the time um, there is, uh, the, the episode for, oh geez, my name, my, my, my brain is blinking. Uh, the, the, uh, holistic, uh, eating health coach mm. episode three mm. name is escaping me. I'm so sorry. Uh, but, um, it, uh, Jason, anywho, uh, go back. I'll do a link on it. Oh, uh, Dr. That, Jason is that I, I watched that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I watched that. That was excellent. Oh, geez. I'm going to have to. Okay. Now I need to go back so that I have this here. Uh, I will do a link uh, on the site. Uh, that is, no, Timothy. Timothy Shaw. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, so uh, he's a, uh, uh, a, a holistic health coach uh, for eating healthy. Uh, so uh, going to be having additional folks here um, uh, as well, focusing on your uh, life, uh, but uh, do take a listen to that as well if you have the opportunity. So, uh, Christopher, thank you so much for uh, giving us a little bit of insight into uh, yourself, your journey. Everyone has a very uh, an interesting journey, I think, because it's you know it, it's a it's a, a a thing of taking the choices and the the opportunities presented to you and uh, what you do with it. Uh, so, um, and some of your insights on the entrepreneurialism journey, um, it's, it's so much to talk about there. That's going to be the, the mainstay of our conversations moving forward. Uh, so, uh, would love to at any point, uh, when you are ready, uh, if you would love to come back and give us some examples, uh, and maybe a demo of, uh, City Spring TV in action, would love to see that, uh, maybe with some case studies of, of, how some potential customers or how potential organizations could, could use that product as it is evolving. Uh, would, would love to uh, have you there. Perhaps we'll be able to connect you up with some folks uh, who are in the group. So uh, thank you so much for your time thank today. You, Absolutely, Christopher. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And again, for everyone viewing and watching, this is Dennis Falco with OutBureau.com. That is O-U-T-B-U-R-O. <laughs> o u t b u r o dot com. If you would like to see uh, past and future video interviews, please subscribe on YouTube as well as check out outbureau dot com podcast page where you are able to see all of the thir currently thirteen and awaiting more uh, places where you are able to listen to this episodes uh, on the go. Perhaps you're at the gym, in the car, or so forth. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Join us now on OutBureau.com, where you belong and your voice matters. Bye-bye.